and uh, well, it's been a while, but it's uh, lovely to be back for another Achieve More Scotland podcast. As you know, with these podcasts, we try to look at specific themes and topics and uh, speak to people uh, with a particular interest or knowledge of, of these topics. And given that uh, we are in October, October being Black History Month, among many other things, we have a special guest to discuss their own involvement uh, with Black History and uh, over the, the, the past Black Lives Matter 2 uh, movement, which has uh, been around for a while, but over the last couple of years, particularly this year, has grown in prominence and uh, people are much more aware of it. Today, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Councillor Graham Campbell. Graham is a Glasgow City Councillor uh, with a long history of uh, political and social activism, not just in Glasgow, it must be added, and we'll find out a bit more about that. Uh, and has uh, represented uh, his particular ward in Glasgow for three years now, I believe. Yes, it is. Okay. Graham, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. As ever with these podcasts, what we like to do is find out a wee bit about the, the person. Um, before we speak about a specific uh, subject, so if you can indulge us and tell us a wee bit about your own history, your background, you clearly, as people will gather from, from your accent, uh, you, well, you've been in Scotland a long time, you're not originally from Scotland. So. Well, this is the question that is uh, at, at hand here. Um, I would say that I am originally from Scotland. I now know this because my great grandfather was born in Scotland. Ah. Um, I didn't know that for most of my life growing up because uh, one of these things my dad didn't bother to tell me that actually his grandfather was born in Scotland, and was a white Scotsman, and you know, so our immediate family is directly descended from here. So uh, I, I would I often say this, but uh, people look at the Scottish diaspora as you know Canadians, Americans, yeah. Australians, white South Africans, actually. The Scottish diaspora is also Jamaicans, Caribbean people, West Africans, people from India, Pakistan, and Hong Kong. Because those are also people with my names and your names who are, have Scottish ancestry because Scotland was part of this British Empire thing. So this is the footprint. So I consider myself Scottish by ancestry and I choose to be Scottish by choice. But I was born in London. I grew up in North London. I spent many years there. I'm uh, my father's Jamaican, my mum's from a, an island called Grenada, um, so they got together in London, so uh, obviously I wouldn't be here without London, so I have to <laughs> give London the credit. But, um, you know, we were a West Indian household or West Indian family that lived in London, so I had always thought of myself as a West Indian, not really a, a Londoner, so yeah. now I would say I, I, I would probably feel more, I'm a Jamaican Scot, <laughs> is how I would describe myself now. That's fair enough, uh, and there's so many connections uh, between Jamaica and Scotland historically, isn't there? Um, and I suppose, as, uh, as, as we said in the introduction, the, the subject of our, our discussion is around about Black History Month, and it would be good to start if uh, you could tell us a wee bit about your knowledge and, and awareness of the connections between Scotland and Jamaica going back centuries. I suppose the importance of Black History Month is that it's not just Black people's history, it's actually everybody's history, but it's it's that bit of the history which they don't tell you about, uh, which is important to everybody's story, because mm -hmm. if Scots just generally knew just how you're involved in, uh, in enslavement of Africans, their society was, and that the origins of a lot of our institutions like bank building societies, industries like shipbuilding and textiles, etc., all have their origins in the exploitation of slavery uh, in the form of produced tobacco, cotton, and sugar. Those three commodities are the reason why Glasgow exists, mm -hmm. and they were all exclusively produced through chattel slavery, as we call it. Chapel meaning you're a thing, you no longer have human rights. It's different from other kinds of slavery. And so that's what's unique about this particular crime. And sadly, Scotland played a, a key role in it. And Glasgow had a pivotal role. It dominated tobacco, then it dominated sugar. So 
why it's important to know because of course it's the reason why all these nice buildings are here it's the reason why these institutions that we've had ever since then are here and you know even universities those they're still benefiting from them now and indeed quite famously uh, the, the when slavery was abolished it wasn't slaves who got compensated it was their slave owners who did and they the government went to a big bailout, had to borrow loads of money to pay it back. And guess what? If you were paying taxes before 2015, as I was, you were still paying that debt back. We only finally finished paying for it in 2015. So uh, this is a live question. It's, it's not dead money. This money's still around. And the, the people who've got it are people who've got country houses and estates now who posh houses and who've got titles and lordships and so on, these people are still around. Yeah. They even still own some of the land they have in Jamaica, so they, they, it's not past stuff. This is still history that's with us. So I suppose it's important first in Black History Month, and in, indeed every month, to remember that you know, black people have played a role, particularly African people have played a role in developing the society we've got now. They've made a contribution, but also they've made contributions to democracy, human rights, civil rights. And it's important to remember that many Glaswegians were opposed to slavery, indeed. Big institutions like the university were opposed to slavery and fought against it. And those abolitionists worked with the slaves who liberated themselves and who fought against mm -hmm. slavery. So it's important to remember that we have good guys on our side too. Yeah, uh, so that, that's important. So History Month is telling us that the fight against slavery the fight against racism, the racism behind that slavery, uh, is important to us because we need to challenge the racism we've got now. Because you know, this has a history, it comes from somewhere, it doesn't come in from nowhere. Mm -hmm. So Black History Month allows you to ask these questions about those histories, tell different stories, highlight the stories of people like Mary Seacole or, you know, Alauda Equiano or very famous African abolitionists mm -hmm. who fought slavery to a standstill. People like Frederick Douglass, who come here from America, put key man in the abolitionist movement in America at the time of their civil war in 1861 to 1865, big ally of President Lincoln. Mm -hmm. That guy came to Scotland, spent pretty much a whole year here, traveling around Scotland. He was the Nelson Mandela of his day. And, and Scotland played a key part in his naming of himself as he was, you know, that wasn't his real name. He, he chose that name after a Scotsman. So yeah. it's important. He loved Robert Burns' his poetry. He, you know, Africans and uh, African Americans and Scotland have a, a long link. So these are really important things that people should just know. Oh, well, absolutely. And I suppose another one that, that I'm aware of is is, is a Dr. McCune, who again, you know, African American, couldn't get into university in the U.S. because he was black. I uh, came to uh, Glasgow, studied uh, medicine, and he uh, was the first black doctor to graduate from Glasgow University. Uh, and you know, so, those, so those links uh, are, 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 are there. I suppose a question I have for you is, do you think that, that most Scots are aware of the things that you've been talking about? Uh, and acknowledge Scotland's contribution to uh, to slavery and how it helped build the country? Um, in a word, no, but there have been recently moves that have changed things in terms of more people are aware, I think, than ever have been before. Uh, it has helped that we've got some very good historians who started to write about it, particularly I have to call out Dr. Stephen Mullen, who wrote yeah. a book called It Was the Us, The Truth About the Plans <laughs> and Slavery, and that It Was the Us is the general you know, Scottish thing about it. We uh -huh. think, oh, the English did that, Liverpool, yeah. London, Bristol, but actually Glasgow did it. And many people in Edinburgh also did it mm -hmm. because they owned the plantation, yeah. they owned the, the revenue that come back from there. They owned companies in Liverpool and London and Bristol mm -hmm. that did the slaving and the training. So Scots were in up to our necks. We were disproportionately represented amongst the slave owners and slaveholders and traders. So we used it. And so the Black Instrument allows us to remember that. Uh, uh, I suppose historians like Stephen have done that, the big historian, a guy called Tom Devine, who's probably mm -hmm. the country's biggest historian. Yes. In fact, he's now come back about five or six years ago now and said, yes, slavery played a massive role in the development of the Industrial Revolution and in country houses and in the economy of Scotland. So we now know that's true. 
you couldn't have had the Scotland that we have today without the slavery of, of yesterday. So now that we know this, and that therefore people are writing books about it, people start to might make television programs and radio programs about that. And particularly, I want to shout out uh, Billy Kay for his radio pro program Scotland's Story, and also David Heyman for his documentary um, on, on slavery, Scotland's Hidden mm -hmm. Shame, a couple of years ago now. Mm -hmm. But that's done a lot to promote a public debate and discussion out there now to say, well, you know, it's our, it's our past, it's our legacy. Now what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do to make amends and to make repair? How are we going to tackle the racism of now mm -hmm. in response to that, that racism yesterday? I think you're right, and I was aware of, of, of how uh, the, the media has played a part in, 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 in making uh, Scots more aware of, 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 of our part uh, in, in that history. Um, I mean, even down to the names of streets. Um, you know, these, these, these uh, streets around the Middle City in particular are all there as a result of Scots' contribution to uh, the, the, the slave trade uh, going back centuries. A specific question for you. What place does black history have in the education system in this country in terms of making our children and young people more aware? It's a difficult one, but it, it, it's the case then, and I think Stephen would tell, tell us this, that it, since 2004, it has been correct that in the curriculum, people are taught about the transatlantic slave trade, the trade between West Africa, Europe, and the Americas, you know, Caribbean, the Caribbean, the trade. You know. So, so if you study in school, you have learned something about that trade. The problem is that it generally tells you about London, Bristol, and Liverpool's connection, mm -hmm. not Scotland's mm -hmm. connection. So that's the thing. You're learning about this trade. You're only learning up to about 1807, when the abolition of the, in the British Empire happens, you know. They don't abolish slavery in the colonies, they abolish yeah. slave trading. So that slave, slavery carries on for another 30 years, pretty much. Uh, but, you know, so we've got a, a sort of narrative story which tells us about how Britain abolished the slave trade, but it benefited from it for 200 years exactly. before abolishing it. Mm -hmm. So, and that Scots were central to it. Mm -hmm. And, and the, indeed, the sort of construction of Britain was partly based on the failure of the Scots to have access to the English colonies. So they created the Union in order for Scots merchants to have access to it. So even the creation of the, the, the country we live in yeah. is, has a, a background. So none of that is really taught in when, when people see that in the schools. So people often have come to me and said, oh, why didn't I learn this in school? Yeah. Why didn't I learn this in school? And it, it's not just a question of you do history. Clearly in everything, every subject, from maths to English to literature, there's loads of contributions of African civilization. So it's not just about the slavery history, it's about what the African and Asian civilizations have contributed to global mm -hmm. history and culture, which is just unrecognized in yeah. the curriculum. So even the word academic, I mean, that's an Arabic word. An admiral, that's an Arabic word. Yeah. You know, the, 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 these words that we just use, which we think are English, not English, they're, they're, there's proof that other civilizations, not European ones, have created culture and learning and education and understanding, which we're not accepting in, and not learning in the way we learn these subjects. So when you learn maths, you know that algebra was, was North Africans and Middle Eastern people who created that. Yes. You know, the numeral system that you're using, Indians created that. Yes. You know, so, so there's just no recognition of those past histories of civilizations and cultures that have contributed to European culture. And that's the point that's missing from the curriculum just generally. So when we say decolonize the curriculum, it means let's be less Eurocentric about it. Let's not uh, carry on the myth that only white people have created civilization and progress. In fact, the world's cultures have created that and they've always intermixed and intermingled. People have always done that. They've always traveled. Uh, and they've always shared knowledge, mm -hmm. and we have to acknowledge where our knowledge comes from. So mm -hmm. that's really the struggle around history. So it's not a surprise that people are ignorant if they have learnt from an empire which has a glorious past, as they keep telling us, as Mr. Johnson keeps trying to tell us, that they shouldn't be apologetic for enslaving the half the world and exploiting them killing them in large numbers, which yes, is absolutely. what slavery was. People have to remember mm -hmm. that it wasn't just, oh, I worked for free for no payment. It was, you were put to death in 
enslavement camps mm -hmm. until you died, and then they replaced you with more people that they exactly. kidnapped yeah. to do it, and that lasted for 200 years. So this wasn't a small crime, it's the biggest crime ever in human history mm -hmm. in which we profited from, and which is builds our, uh, our society as we know it now. So it's the curriculum, what you learn in school is crucial to just know the truth about that. It doesn't mean we want to make people feel guilty about it, just that knowing the truth allows you to deal with it properly and therefore work out <laughs> How do you then relate to the society yeah. that you're living in now yeah. and then what you want it to be? Mm -hmm. The Lives Matter movement uh, is, 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 is increasing, it uh, has a high profile uh, and my concern is that there's still a lot of ignorance around about why Black Lives Matter. I had a family member saying to me last night, sitting watching the news, but all lives matter. And someone who's elderly, someone who uh, you know is has had that previous education at school, which is very, very narrow, but fails to, to recognise the the importance and the need for movements such as should Black Lives Matter to to highlight what's going on in the world just now. What is the significance of black history? to the current Black Lives Matter campaign movement. It's not a campaign, sorry, movement. Okay, I suppose we are the latest incarnation of, if you like, a civil rights movement. In a way, the civil rights movement of the 60s, 50s and 60s, probably led to, uh, in large part, what we now call Black History Month. But the, the need for its recognition in the curriculum grew arms and legs in the 60s in America with the civil rights movement for equality. And also, you have to say, the, seven, the 60s and 70s were a big time of African decolonization and African and Caribbean countries becoming independent. So that was also important, was the liberation struggles that we had to wage. So I think the combination, too, I grew up in the 70s uh, so and 80s, so I kind of was already schooled in the anti-apartheid struggle with Nelson Mandela trying to be free. And, you know, so all of these Competing influences for Caribbean culture and independence, African independence, and the civil rights movement in the States were all influences on us. So today, the Black Lives Matter movement is, is really con uh, coalescing a lot of different experiences. But obviously, the, the fight globally against police racism and injustice, just generally in the United States in particular, is the worst examples. But uh, that's racist policing, something we know about. Them. Okay. Mm -hmm. you know, we've had 1,740 deaths yes. in police custody and uh, as far as I know, not a single police uh, prosecution since 1969. Um, Vince Kelso Cochran was the last one yes. where a policeman was sent down for killing a, a black man in custody. So we've had all of these unanswered deaths. Um, only one of these has been in Scotland, but it's one too many. It's Sheku Bayer yes. from five years ago in, in Kokodi. Not enough people know his name, by the way, but one of the things that Black Lives Matter has achieved is it's made the connection between police injustice there with police injustice all over the world, whether it's in Australia or Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sad in one respect that people in Scotland didn't get to know about Sheikh and Bayer until after George Floyd. Yes. And I know from five years ago when Ferguson happened, when Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin had been killed, the first attempts to link the families who had experienced police injustice here, you know, the, the Marcy Rigg from the families campaign in, in the UK was uh, you know, part of this network of families campaigns, which we supported. So in 2015, we hosted uh, visitors from Ferguson and from Los Angeles to come to speak in Scotland, so they spoke in Edinburgh and Glasgow. So we filmed, formed the sort of Black Lives Matter coalition at that point, uh, but it didn't really take off, partly because I think there wasn't a wide enough awareness amongst just black people actually, mm -hmm. even, and also just amongst the wider population of just how big a problem racism is. Those Black Lives Matter demonstrations on June the 7th, though, that picked up in Scotland, that we think about maybe 30,000 people together were on the streets mm -hmm. of, of, of Scotland's cities and, and towns, you know, about up to 10,000 in Glasgow, maybe about seven or 8,000 in Edinburgh. Nobody's seen that many black people on Scotland's streets yeah. ever. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is simple. Young black people who've grown up in Scotland over the last 20 years have only known Scottish institutions, they've been to Scottish schools, mm -hmm. they've been to Scottish workplaces, they have 
grown up with the, the daily racisms that they have to face, whether it's microaggressions on a bus or in a shop, mm -hmm. you know, security guards following you around, I mean, don't sit next to you, or people, whether it's the openly aggressive verbal abuse or physical abuse that you've, you've experienced, whether it's police stopping you in your car. The fact that those experiences are so widespread, and that when, it, you know, I've had lots of conversations with parents in the last few months about how their kids experience racism in school and it's not dealt with by the schools. Uh, and this is a very wide experience from every ethnic background and from every part of Scotland. I've spoken to people from Shetland to Dumfries. So I know this is a, a massive problem where people have this myth in their heads that Scotland doesn't do racism, that we are all jump jumps and spins and therefore we don't have racism. We do. And those demonstrations showed several things. Not only do we have a racism problem in Scotland, but also that young black people in Scotland, they may be proud to be Scots, and they may be proud of their heritage, but they're fed up with racism and are not going to take it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's the clearest message. So the big demands they had was, we want these slavery names on streets and statues celebrating slave owners removed. Mm -hmm. We want uh, the decolonization of the curriculum so that we stop denigrating African and Caribbean people's history and culture in, in our the way we educate ourselves, but also that we want actual institutionalised racism to go. We want access to jobs, education, housing, labour markets, all these things that make a normal life possible. Black Lives Matter doesn't just mean being alive and not being killed by the police. It means having a decent life and being able to live freely. And what I think are many Scots and many white people across the world actually have probably learned for the first time is just how pervasive this racism mm -hmm. is. It's made it visible for them because, of course, these atrocities have appeared on video. We just had the latest of them uh, just this week and just gone. Mm -hmm. you know, in, in the, just how much violence and disrespect is used towards the black community.